Thank you, Selma. And so our, our next guest is one you've heard everyone sing the praises of over and over and over, and that is because none of this would happen without her. Um, Terry Sherrill has the distinction of being the one and only individual who has directly worked on all 50 issues of Borderlands. Pretty unique. <laughs> all 50. Educated at St. Ed's and at UT, she's utilized her talent here locally since her days at Morgan Printing, where she helped design the very, very first issue of the journal. Putting forth her skills in designing and printing, her passion for the work contained on the inside pages of each journal we print is proof of why we consider her an additional staff member. Uh, here to talk briefly about her experience with Borderlands, please welcome the one, the only, Terry Carroll. <laughs> I met Michael Morgan, who at that time owned Express Press, and he specialized in printing the Armadillo World Headquarters posters. And um, he, had, he confided in me that really what he would prefer to do is work on books. He found it more interesting and more lucrative. And at that time, we both um, rented, uh, sublet at least space from Jenny's printing, or at that time it was Jenny's copying. I don't know if any of y'all recall. And um, eventually, um, you know, we went our separate ways, and I uh, found myself at, uh, working at Morgan Printing. He had turned Express Press into Morgan Printing, and um, he specialized in books and publications. And while I was there, I worked on design and uh, production for books. One, uh, I looked at my calendar one day and had an appointment to meet with a couple of people who wanted to come in to uh, talk about starting a new literary journal, and in walk the door with Dorothy Barnett with her long black hair down past her waist, and Darcy Randall. They were like a pair of mismatched sisters. <laughs> <laughs> they have always been really close. Um, our discussion lasted for hours as they unveiled how the Missioner Center was unable to help the Missioner Fellows with the publication, and how along with their fellows, like Liz Gart here today, um, they financed their undertaking in large part with a garage sale for literature. And I remember thinking, I saw that garage sale in the green sheet, and <laughs> was tried to make it to it and missed it. But they had scrounged together enough money, they thought, you know, to come in and, and talk about this publication. Darcy and Dorothy followed along as I led them through the details of publishing and my tech checklist of book elements, production specifications, and publication resources. And then they laid out their plans of careful and delicate choices structured as firmly as the lines of a good poem. They brought in an enormous piece of James Searle's original artwork to shoot the cover. It was probably three of these put together. It was like four and a half by four feet or something. Um, and we set up a photo shoot at Morgan Printing. Dorothy knew that she wanted that red band at the top and bottom, and we weren't sure if we were gonna go with a white cover, so we tried white, we tried black, we tried several different things, and finally came up with a look. They also had the title Verso wording already in place, and while we had tried out different fonts and, and page design treatments to review, the decisions they made always just seemed clear and obvious what to do. And then behind the scenes, they had to acquire the ISSN number from the Library of Congress. They had to pull together the bookkeeping, which I don't think was Darcy's forte, but she undertook it. And um, they had to make arrangements for periodical distribution and scheduling receptions and readings. Future issues were underwritten in part with grants petition from the City of Austin Cultural Award. These are easy things to gloss over here, but the underpinnings of administration are extremely time consuming, as James and Allison can attest to, and they're very complicated. The love of literature was enough for them to make this happen, and the foundation for Borderlands, the Texas Poetry Review, was laid. After many years of 
working with Borderlands editors, there was some trepidation when Dorothy moved on to found the creative writing department at Austin Community College. And she also founded new journals, the Rio Review and the Poetry at Round Top. And Darcy became immersed in her um, doctoral studies and a teaching position at the University of Texas. So the future of Borderlands was uncertain. And I sat through several nail-biting meetings at the Writers League of Texas and among the committee and board members, not sure what was going to happen until Ramona Kearley stepped up to the director's position in 2000. And it has been a delight to see her long fingers work in, with a collaborative effort with our community, including the Blanton Museum and the Bob Bullock Museum. And her resourcefulness is outstanding in inviting editors, artists, and photographers who've made amazing contributions. And it has been an asset to both Borderlands and to the artists. Ramona's hand stirred the waters of Central Texas and kept Borderlands alive and vibrant in the Texas community. Aside from her aesthetic contributions, Ramona documented the behind-the-scenes organization that passed along to the new leadership in 2018. It is now my pleasure to work on the production with Allison and James, and uh, I have enjoyed helping select the colors uh, and working with the art and the fine-tuning of the layout for many years. Morgan Printing, on the other hand, came full circle and joined Jenny's Printing in 2010. <laughs> in, two, in 2012, it was acquired by One Touchpoint. And today, the home, the production home for Borderlands is One Touchpoint. My road these past 27 years along the literary highway has always seemed the same, but always different. And it finds me enjoying the pleasure of seeing the 50th anniversary issue of Borderlands, a collective produced from the love of literature.